How's everyone doing? Good? All right, got some food? Perfect. Um, when I was about 12 years old, I really wanted a boot knife. And I figured if I had a boot knife, if I, there were any strange attackers or ninjas, I could take it on my boot and stab them with it. Uh, I think most boys around the age of 12 want some sort of knife. Uh, obviously, I couldn't go buy this because I was 12, and uh, my parents were stern enough to not buy this for me. My solution to this problem was I was going to steal one of my mother's paring knives and then find household items to build an apparatus. So I got a terry cloth towel and cut it in the shape of a knife. When folded, it would, it would fit the knife. Uh, some needle and some thread, uh, stitched it up, and then cut an old baseball belt to strap it around my ankle. It seemed to work. Um, but I knew I, I had to test this thing. And my smoke test for this device was that if I could sleep in this, it would be totally realistic to carry it around at all times with me, because that's what 12-year-old Chris thought. Um, if you know anything about me, you know where the story is going. About two hours into sleep, the knife went through the terry cloth towel and stabbed me in the leg. Um, thinking about this story uh, 20 years later made me realize a few things. Um, the first, um, I'm not a creator, I'm not a maker. Uh, the engineering was poor, the implementation was even poorer. Uh, it's just not for me. But after I stabbed myself, I did learn a lesson. Uh, if this strap would have been two straps and the terry cloth would have been replaced with leather or plastic or something a knife couldn't go through, it would have made a much better device. Um, maybe this was foreshadowing for my future career. Uh, I'm a professional breaker. I break things for a living. Uh, the nice way to say it is offensive security specialist, but I think most people in this room would call me a computer hacker. That's what I do by trade. Uh, companies hire uh, me to break their stuff, and I help them fix it up better. But also, it reminded me of a lot of technology that I see nowadays. Um, you know, everyone makes this new device and makes it connected and makes it accessible for everyone. Um, but most people don't think about it from a breaker's perspective. They just like new technology, don't we all? Um, companies now just get a bunch of different bits and pieces, put them together, and it's your next new I, whatever you want to call it. Um, the way I think about these things is it's not just a shiny metal box. This is a computer to me, right? Everything in this room that has computers in it, I want to break. That's just what I do. Um, I'm kind of a simple guy. I like to color by numbers. Uh, I like crosswords that are only three letters long. So I figure I'll just give you a couple examples of things that I've seen in recent times and tell you how I think about them. I think a great um, example of things that are put together kind of haphazardly are smart meters. Um, I think most people know what smart meters are now, but they you know, have a way of keeping track of electricity so you can view it online. The power company can turn on and off the power without sending out a technician. Overall, it's great technology. But essentially, it's your regular old power meter. And they didn't make the radio chip. They outsourced that and bought it from someone. And they didn't make the LCD for your user interface. They bought that from somewhere. And then they probably bought or used open source software to put all these things together. Um, they were never really designed for that. Uh, and the way I see it is when they added these together, they probably weren't thinking about someone like me thinking, how can I subvert this thing to make it do cool stuff, like turn off my neighbor's power, right? <laughs> Those are the things I think about. Maybe the LCD communicates insecurely, and I can physically look at the device and use it. This made me realize that other things uh, are like this, and, and generally we're in a more connected society. Um, but you don't have to think of only the product being secure when you're designing it, but how it will be used in the future. Um, who here has like a GoPro camera? Right? Those things are rad. You can do all kinds of stuff with them. They go underwater. They're great. Um, they also want the ex user experience to be better for everyone, too. They want you to be uh, able to communicate wirelessly and um, you know, add things onto it. Uh, again, from a breaker's perspective, I look at this as an entry point. This isn't a shiny metal box, it's a camera. To me, it's a miniarized computer that has a camera with it. 
Um, I have some friends doing some research, and they figured out you know, what operating system this thing's running and how it's similar to others and its architecture, a bunch of you know, boring hacker crap. Um, but you know, most people don't care that their GoPro gets owned, right? Because you just have awesome pictures of me shredding on the Allegheny and not much else. But say this product matures, which it has been, this technology is picked up by others, and you end up using this technology for surveillance cameras or police dashboard cameras. Then it goes from being kind of a toy hack, something that you did for fun, to something that has consequence. Uh, not only do you have to try to make a secure device, but you have to think about it in a range of 10 to 20 years. Will this technology maybe be adopted? It's, it's hard to have a crystal ball like that. And that made me think about what's really the underlying problem with all this technology. And um, in recent times, uh, Dr. Charlie Miller and myself became kind of infamous as the car hacker guys. What we did was we bought ourselves some cars and figured out how the computers worked and how they communicated. And then we could do cool stuff with our computers, like steer the wheel, uh, engage the brakes, disengage the brakes, accelerate the automobile, tighten the seatbelts. Just about anything the car did, we could do with our computers. And the reason we were able to do this is the way automobile networks are designed. It's quite antiquated uh, when you think about technology. The way these things work is each computer in the car is on this network, and each has a specific duty, whether it's tightening the seatbelt, uh, starting the engine, or using the ABS system. They all have very specific purposes. Um, unfortunately, they also communicate in a broadcast nature. They don't go www.powersteering.com. Uh, they just send these messages out, and whoever's listening will say, hey, that one's for me. Well. You don't, they don't need to ask who sent it or where it came from as well. And so if you send a message out, say, hey, turn the steering wheel. This is the angle you should turn it to. If it recognizes the format, it'll say, yeah, turn it around. Um, this technology was developed by Bosch in the late 70s and early 80s, decades ago. And at the time, they didn't have a crystal ball. They developed this cool system that works fast and reliably, and the car works, right? Um, but again, they didn't know that eventually we'd be adding this new technology onto old technology. So now cars have what I consider entry points. Bluetooth communications, right? Everyone wants to talk without their hand on the phone. Um, since 2006, every car produced in the United States had to have tire pressure monitoring systems on them. Uh, those are radio communications between the tires and the car, uh, you know, monitoring the pressure so you don't have a catastrophic failure. Again, for someone like me, uh, it's not technology, it's a way to get into the car. And once you're into the car, well, you kind of have the keys to the castle because they developed this technology 30 plus years ago and they never thought that we would have things like that on a car. Cars even have in-car uh, app stores and Wi-Fi now, right? These are all kind of attack surfaces when you ask me. So what does this, what does this all mean? Um, People like me don't consider themselves adversaries to people that create. I'm not breaking your car or whatever because I hate you or I hate your technology. Uh, sometimes you get a little bit vindictive, but usually you want to break this because you like technology. You want to see how, it figure, how, how to figure it out and what you can do with it. Um, uh, a lot of the times, people come back when you try to tell them that they have something wrong, and they're very angry about it, and they think that you're out to get them. Um, we're not the bad guys. People like me aren't the bad guys. Bad guys are people who don't tell you what's wrong with your system, and then exploit it for personal or financial gain. People like me reported to you, so you as a creator, which is hard enough as it is to create something beautiful and useful, um, can actually break it down and fix it and make it better for all of us. The software industry has actually been really gracious these days with this type of thing. Uh, Microsoft, Facebook, and Google, uh, three for examples, uh, not only do they encourage people like me to find flaws in their product, but they have things called bug bounties, where they'll actually give me money if I report something to them that I found in the product. So they seem to get it. Uh, unfortunately, whether it's Furbies or automobiles, uh, they tend to really look at us as adversaries and that's not the case. So I hope 
by talking to people like you, I can get the message out that people like me aren't a bad guy. We really want to work with everyone and make this world a better, more secure place. Thanks for 10 minutes of your life. Thank you.